Dr. Mindy here, and today we're going to talk about this book, The Obesity Code. So we, if you've been in my Resetter group, we've been dissecting this book for about a half a week now, and there's some really key concepts to weight loss in this book that have never been really explained the way that Dr. Fung explains it before. So we're doing a book study for the next couple weeks. If this is the first time you're hearing about it and you want to join us, uh, just put resetters in the comment section and I'll make sure that you get into that, uh, into my closed group where we're analyzing every little ounce of this book possible. But today, the purpose of today's video is that there are six parts to this book. And today I want to go through part one and I want to go a little bit through the beginning of part two because there's some really cool uh, assumptions we've made about dieting that are all wrong and I want to make sure that you, before I we dive into insulin control and dive into how you lose weight I want you to understand why the way you've been doing it up until now is an epic fail and it's not your fault and why it will never work because in order to take on the new paradigm of weight loss that Dr. Fung puts in this book you're gonna have to let go of the old paradigm. So today we're gonna talk about calorie, calorie restriction, we're gonna talk a little bit about inheriting genes that make you obese, we're gonna talk about the idea that you should exercise more and eat less, those are kind of key things we're gonna talk about. Um, this is unlike any other Facebook Live I've done, uh, this is, uh, I will be stopping to answer questions, so if you have questions, just put them in the comment section, and if you're not watching this live, just put them in the, your questions in the comment, comment section, and I'll make sure that I answer them at another time. So, okay, again, the obesity code is what we're going through. Part one, a little bit of part two. I have made a ton of notes. So, I want to start off, I actually have one, two, three, four, I have six different uh, topics that I want to talk about that really stood out to me in part one of the book. And the first one, and I've been doing some, some uh, Facebook Lives on this earlier in the week, is really this idea that calorie restriction diets do not work. So what I love about what Fung does in here is he takes us back through history and he shows us like what, why we're the most obese, if you live in America, we're the most, most obese country in the world um, and why that is and why calorie restriction hasn't worked. So there's a couple of key concepts with calorie restriction that you have to know. And I, and I talked about this earlier in the week. The first is that calorie restriction diets are all built off of the premise that you have to have extreme discipline to be able to lose weight. And I think this is so interesting because I work with a lot of people who struggle to lose weight and I, they will sit across from me as we're brainstorming their health history and they will tell me, I eat incredibly well, I do not eat that much food, but I still am gaining weight. That's a very classic uh, story that I hear. If that's you, put it in the comment section because I see so, especially women that are eating impeccably and they're still either holding on to weight or they're gaining weight. Why is that? Well, Fung does an incredible job in here explaining that if you eat a 3,000 calorie diet every single day, and one day you look in the mirror and you're like, ugh, I don't like this body I'm living in anymore, and you decide to start reducing your calories, what happens is at, at the, in the beginning, right off the bat, you may get a little bit of a weight loss, maybe a pound or two, but within a matter of a few days, your energy expenditure goes down to meet the new calorie intake that you have. So if you were at 3,000, you go down by 500, you're now eating 2,500 calories a day, eventually your metabolism will go down to 2,500. And over time, then you go down a little bit more and then your metabolism goes down a little bit more. This is why it's so frustrating to lose weight because your metabolism will always match your calorie content. So I love how he puts in there that this is the major problem is that it's really focused off of discipline. Now, the other point that he, that he, that he uses, he uses the, the idea of eat less, exercise, move more is what he says. Eat less, move more. 
Now, if you've been in my resetter group or you're a patient of mine uh, and you've been working with me for a while, you know that what we say is don't eat less, eat less often. Because as you'll find out as you start to dissect this book, weight loss is really a issue of hormonal control. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. But he brings up on page nine, I thought this was really interesting. He brought up the idea that if you look at like our experts in nutrition right now, we, you look at our authorities in healthcare, uh, if we just took the medical doctors in general, you walk into your medical doctor's office and they tell you that the problem with your health is that you've, you've got too much weight, that you're obese or, or according to their chart, you, you have to, are carrying too much weight. But then you look at the medical doctor and he or she is carrying too much weight. And, he, and what was fascinating to me about what Fung said is he said in order to be a doctor, especially of the, the more education you have, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline. So why can't your medical doctor lose weight? And part of it is because they're operating, if they've been trying, under the, pers the, under the idea that weight loss is an issue of discipline. And it's not, it's an issue of hormone control. And I think that's, he just, he beautifully states that. The other thing that he points out is that there are two ways, when you start to look at weight, there are two things that you have to look at. You, you have to look at the proximate problem, meaning, okay, so over the weekend I ate, let's say I ate too much, and yeah, maybe I feel like I put on a couple of pounds. Well, the, uh, the, the um, immediate solution is we'll stop eating too much. And then, and then all of a sudden your body will recalibrate, re recalibrate. But he said what happens is nobody's looking at the ultimate cause of weight gain. And he used alcoholism as, as a really key statement. He said with alcoholism, you can look at somebody who drinks too much alcohol and you can say, well, the proximate problem is just you drink too much alcohol. You need to stop drinking so much alcohol. But really underneath all of that is the ultimate problem, like maybe they have a gene for alcoholism. Maybe their life is incredibly stressful. Maybe they have a family history of alcoholism. There's something underneath there that's causing the ultimate problem. And I think that's really true about weight gain as well. As we start to pack on weight over the years, there's really a reason that we reach for food. I, I call it a state change. That oftentimes we reach for food because we need to have some kind of emotional change. So are there some strategies we can do to, to change our state? Uh, listen to great music, listen to uh, uh, meditate, go for a walk, laugh with some friends, watch a funny movie. Like there's some other ways you can change your state than going to your refrigerator and just eating a, a food to have a temporary state phase uh, change. And he calls it the why. You got to get to the why of why you have been eating the way that you've been eating. So I love that. And he, and he, it was like one section on page nine, but because I've worked with so many people, I think it's really important to understand that why you eat a certain way, once you identify that, and there's usually many factors, then once you get a hold of that, it's amazing how you can totally change your relationship with food. I use myself as an example. Um, when I, I'm 48 now, when I was in my early 20s, I was carrying 20, 30 extra pounds. And I used food as an emotional healer. When I had a bad day, I'd come home and eat. It was very much a state change. But the minute I did two things, the first was when I identified that, I could really start to look at other things that make me happy other than food. And then the second thing is I really started to trust my body and learn about my body and really tap into what my body needed. And I think that's what I really wanna do over the next couple of weeks is help you guys understand what your body really needs. So the next thing he went on to talk about was how did we get to this place that we're at right now? How did we get to this calorie, calorie restriction life, this eat less, move more idea? How do we have so many experts that are telling us this is the way to lose weight? And he goes back into history and he says, if you go back into the 1950s and you look at what some of the greatest health problems were in the, in the 1950s, it was heart disease. So when they went to go look at heart disease as being this epidemic that was growing, 
what they had to do is find a villain. They had to find what was causing heart disease to be a problem. And one person, it was, believe it or not, it was only one doctor that stood up and said, it's fat. It's too much fat that's causing placking on the side of the walls, causing blood pressure to go up. Um, that's the, that is the number one reason for heart disease. Now, this is not the course where we're gonna discuss heart disease, but if you, you haven't been filled in on current science, they are now saying that yes, bad fat is, is hard on the arteries, but sugar has a bigger impact on placking of the side walls of your arteries than anything else. So he said, if you look at, there are three macronutrients that we can eat at every meal. We can eat fat, we can eat protein, and we can eat carbohydrates. So if you take uh, fat out of the equation, if you're eating a low fat diet and you take it out of the equation, that only leaves two other ma macronutrients to eat. That's protein and that's carbohydrates. So all of a sudden we started eating more protein and more carbohydrates, specifically carbohydrates. We started really upping our carbohydrates and that is why we've gotten to be more obese and more obese. And by the way, that was in the 1950s. We're in 2018 right now. And we literally have the uh, even worse heart disease issue than we did back in the 1950s when they first brought out this idea that um, fat was the cause of heart disease. So it, I think that's really interesting. The, the other piece when I look at that is if you have three macronutrients, you can pretty much take any diet. So let's go paleo for a, for a moment. What, and let's even look at Atkins. What happened with Atkins? Atkins was the first diet that came out and said it has nothing to do with calories. It has to do with carbohydrates. There was a very, very first place that, had that, that made that kind of statement. And people lost weight on, on Atkins. But what Atkins did is they said, okay, three ma ma macronutrients. I'm going to take carbs out, eat as much protein, and eat as much fat as you possibly can. But people got even worse health, they lost weight, but cholesterol, blood pressure, heart problems went through the roof because they were eating bad fat as well. Then you come over here and you look at paleo. What did paleo say? Paleo said, oh my gosh, carbohydrates are bad, so they, they were a continuation of Atkins. But they also, in paleo, a lot of people struggled because paleo was all protein. So many people were eating too much protein. So as we go through the next couple weeks, you're gonna see that uh, when I look at the ketogenic life, what we're saying is moderate protein. We're saying that fat, good fat, is a major fuel source for your brain and for your body and it shuts down hormones like um, ghrelin, which is the one that helps you, uh, is your hunger hormone. It will um, lower insulin. Fat, good fat, can have an incredible beneficial impact on your hormonal system. So, you, but it doesn't mean taking carbs out that we're going high protein. We're going moderate protein and we're going high good fat. That's the difference of where keto has really started to evolve, okay? So, other things. He talks about, on, in chapter two, he talks about inheriting obesity. So I think this is really interesting. I can tell you when I go out into the world and you look at families and you see that they're all uh, carrying weight in very similar areas, I think it's pretty much a social, socially accepted for us to look and say, well, that family must just have a gene that makes them all look that way. But what Dr. Funk points out in, in chapter two is that families all have very similar lifestyles. So they eat very similarly, they move very similar, similarly, their stress levels, how they handle stress is very similar. So we can't rule out that just because you have people in your family that have gained weight and, and have a certain shape that that's how you're supposed to be. You can change, if you change your lifestyle, you can actually start to change the way that you hold on to fat. Now, totally outside of this book, are some great studies. I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but you can go look up the Agouti Mouse study done by Duke University where they found that exposure to BPA plastics can trigger an obesity gene that causes people to hold on to weight. You can go look at Michael Skinner's work. He's out of Washington State University where he found 
if a grandparent was exposed to DDT, that it would go down 11 generations. Somebody would, it could turn on the obesity gene and it would continue down 11 generations before that gene could be turned off. So there is this epigenetic piece. If you know, if you look around at your relatives and you're like, wow, everybody packs on weight, you can either do one of two things. You can say, well, that's just my destiny. That's the way I'm supposed to be. Or you can say, well, I'm gonna change my lifestyle and I'm going to detox so that I can turn these genes off. And epigenetics has taught us that we can do that. Again, at another time, I will be going through what epigenetics means and what the, those studies have taught us. Um, and then the last thing I really wanna talk about is on page 36, he talks about really five different assumptions that we've been making. And I think it's pretty important to dissect these assumptions. So the one thing that I think we've all been operating on is that if I lower my, that kept my calories in and my calories out are independent of each other. And what Fung points out is actually they are not independent of each other. And like I said, what we have dis discovered is that as you lower your calorie uh, amount, you also lower your calorie expenditure. So your metabolism literally will come down. This was proven in the Minnesota starvation experiment way back in the 1940s, where they took a group of men and they put them on a massively restricted calorie diet. And they found that the, each time they kept lowering it, their metabolism would just come down, 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 and down. And then when the experiment was over, what ended up happening is the men immediately gained the weight back and then they added on some. Because not because they necessarily overate, but they went up to a higher calorie input, but they had trained their body to have this lower calorie expenditure, okay? So I thought that was interesting, assumption number one. Assumption number two, that your metabolism is stable. This is really fascinating. So your metabolism is not stable. Your metabolism is changing all the time. Just, you know, like the extra, uh, HIIT training has taught us this. We, we know from like Tabata's training, if you guys haven't studied what Tabata found out, he found out that you could put somebody on a treadmill and they could exercise for an hour and their metabolism, they would, their metabolism wouldn't change at all. That all they were doing is burning calories. Or you could make, put somebody and, and give them sprints. You could give them 30 second sprints where their heart rate goes up and down and their metabolism would greatly change for up to 48 hours. This is why you see so many people who are doing HIIT training now, because it's a, it's a, a more uh, advanced way to get your metabolism to, be, to raise. Do you know that your brain is one of your, your is the organ that, that uses the most or will speed up your metabolism the most? So sometimes you're sitting down doing a test or you're studying, you're actually burning more calories, you're raising your metabolism because you're using your brain. If you have more muscle, you're gonna, your metabolism is gonna be higher. Metabolism is never stable. Your metabolism, and, uh, which is also scientifically known as your basal metabolic rate, is always changing. So I can't look at you and say, oh, you're five, six, and therefore you need to be, um, and your weight is this, so you should burn this many calories. That's, it, that equation, which a lot of people have been following, doesn't work because your metabolism is constantly changing. Um, okay, assumption number three is that we have conscious control over how we eat. Now, this is a total game changer. He basically says that your hunger levels are really determined upon two things. One, how often you eat. So if you're eating six meals a day, you will train your body to be more hungry than somebody who's eating two meals a day. Second thing so is, it's your hormones. So if your insulin's out of balance, if ghrelin's out of balance, if, if glucagon's out of balance, then what ends up happening is that you are more hungry. So he went on to show that these lower calorie diets actually increase hunger. Uh, low fat diets, they know, increase hunger. Um, if you eat low calorie and then you exercise a bunch, you actually increase hunger. So your, your control over what you eat is really a hormonal issue. Um, my husband and I were talking about this last night at dinner, 
that since we started eating keto, since we started fasting, um, we are not hungry anymore. Literally, I can go a whole day and forget to eat. Or I can get hungry at two and decide to eat an avocado and I'm good until seven o'clock at night. Well, that's because I've tapped into how to balance insulin. I've tapped in how to balance my hormones. I'm not counting calories anymore. I'm, I'm really manipulating um, hormones. So really interesting. That was on, this is on page 36, all of his assumptions. So, and, uh, oh, the other thing, we have two more thoughts here. And one is that um, we have had this assumption that fat storage is unregulated, meaning it just happens. Well, that's not the case at all. Everything in our body is controlled by a chemical messenger system, and that's our hormones. So if you can work on keeping your hormones balanced, then you can actually control your fat storage. There are two hormones that affect fat storage. Insulin is your fat storage hormone. So if your insulin levels are high, which is the premise of his book, then you will end up storing more fat. And leptin is your fat burning hormone. So leptin lives in your adipose tissue and your fat tissue, and it tells, sends a signal up to the hypothalamus, and it says, hey I'm, hey, I'm down here. You may wanna burn me for fat. But things like, you've probably heard the term obesogens. Obesogens are chemicals in our environment, like BPA plastic, can get in the receptor sites of leptin and make it nearly impossible for the hypothalamus and for uh, the fat to communicate. So you end up just gaining more weight, storing more fat, your body doesn't know how to burn fat. So those are the two hormones you really wanna manipulate if you wanna start uh, getting that really severe stored fat under control. And we'll, again, over the next two weeks, we'll go into that. And then my last point is that, and the last assumption is really around uh, calories are not equal. So he talks about how sugar will create this hormonal response in your body that's going to have you store fat. Well, it, it, olive oil may actually have more calories, but it won't have that same hormonal response. It'll actually do the opposite. It'll lower your blood sugar. It'll, kick, uh, it'll decrease your hormones that control hunger. It'll bring that down, but it may be more calorie dense. So when I, like, I go into a lot of times into uh, elementary schools, I teach kids how to read a label. And I, the first thing I tell them is don't ever look at the calories. The calories don't tell you anything about what that food's gonna do for you. The fat content, the type of fat that's in there, the ingredients and the carbohydrate and sugar load will tell you way more about what that food's gonna do for you than anything else. So he leaves us after part two, he really talks about, you know, okay, he's totally broken down this idea that calories, eat less, move more, is why we have the obesity problem that we have. So now, what do we do? We really need to move into controlling insulin. That's, it's the bottom line of how do we control insulin. And I'm gonna show you over the next couple of weeks how you do control insulin. We're gonna go into the other parts of his book. This is where fasting is so amazing because fasting can get down into those really stored areas of, of fat that you just can't get with any other type of, of way of eating. I'm gonna show you some people who have lost significant weight. I'm hoping today I'm, I'm actually having dinner with Cindy Edelson who is a family friend who's lost over 60 pounds just by following our resetter fasts every month. She, could, or she just got her insulin down and all of a sudden the body just started to let go. And I, I tell my patients this all the time, that when you eat in a certain way to lower insulin, what will end up happening is it's like the scale may not move in the beginning, but it's like all of a sudden one day you wake up and it's like a coat that somebody just took off, a coat of fat that somebody just took off and you, your whole shape starts to shift. And I see it in people all the time, they'll lose it around their midsection first. Sometimes women will lose it around their chest first. And as the body start, as that insulin starts to come down, it signals that you need to, that the body needs to go in and reach for some of that stored fat. So it's brilliant. It, it's truly, I, I, this is why I wanted to do a, a book study on it. I think it's the most revolutionary approach to weight loss. It is here to stay because it's built off of how our body wants us to eat. 
and it's got proof and science behind it. So I'd love those of you that have fasted, those of you that have done the keto, those of you diet, those of you that have taken carbohydrates out and upped your good fat, just share your experience in the comments because I still find people are fat phobic. They're scared of moving away from fat. They're scared of fasting. They're scared of not counting calories. They can't even imagine not counting calories. And it's been just so erroneously like pushed on us. And what I'm hoping to do with this book study is really help you all see that this is why people can't lose weight. So if you want the results other people have been getting, then keep living that way. But if you want a totally different result, you're gonna to have to look at weight loss from a different angle, and that's really what Dr. Fung does. So I hope that's helpful. This again, this is a longer Facebook Live than I've, than I've done before. Um, if you have questions, just put them in the comment section. Um, I'm, I'm here to support you. If you're not in my resetter group, just put resetters, we'll invite you in. There's some great dialogue going on in there. If you've struggled with anything that I just said, let's, let's chat about it. I'd love to, to hear your comments. I know this is a total kick in the side of the head. Um, and if you love this information, share this video out. Let's get it out to people so people can start to really uh, approach their weight loss from a different angle. Um, I, and that, in my opinion, this is just how we're going to change healthcare when we start to change the way we've been approaching food. So, as always, any questions at all? That uh, we've lots of positive comments. Um, a lot of people watching. So, anybody have any last questions before we go off? Okay. So, come find me in my resetter group, and I hope this. If this was helpful, again, just put helpful in there. So. Um, I went into a lot of detail. I don't normally go into this much detail, but because this is a book study, I really want you guys to get every little ounce out of this book. So, okay, hope that helps. What, uh, what about, um, what insulin, what should insulin be in order to get into fat burning? She knows ketones 1.5 or over. Yeah, so insulin? we're going to go into all the measurements on insulin in the Resetter group. That, that's coming down the road. I'll show you because the only way you can measure insulin is through a blood test. Um, by a lab, uh, and there's two things you're going to look at is insulin, and you're going to look at um, hemoglobin A1C. So we'll go, if you're in the Resetter group, stay tuned. I'm going to go through all of that. I've been teaching you guys 70 to 90 with your blood glucose. I think that's the range you want to start with. Once you've mastered that, once you're getting above 0.5 with your ketones, you, we're, we're on the right path. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean your insulin's low, and we want it low, like under three is usually what I look for. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is another uh, number that I'll teach you as well because that's what your insulin's been doing for many, many years. It's the pre-diabetic number that they look at, so. And a lot of the blood tests that we do, or the finger prick tests that we do to um, give you the keto, the glucose levels, yeah. right? And so what should, like, where, where's the spot you're aiming for? Between, okay. Yeah, so if you do... Between the two numbers. Yeah, um, be, somewhere between 70 and 90 is great. So I, every, I get up in the morning, I always do my blood glucose first thing in the morning, and uh, I'm looking for something under 90. If I'm under 90, then I kind of go, okay, cool, the way I ate yesterday worked for me. If I start creeping up above 90 or above into the hundreds, I go, oh, okay, what did I eat? What I eat last night was my stress up. Like, well, I'm gonna walk you through all the different things that will manipulate that number because it's not just food. It can also be uh, the, it can be how long you've been fasting. It can be gut bacteria. It can be stress levels. We're gonna talk about all of that. Um, if this is new to you and you're just hearing about those ketone readers, you know, we used to think the blood glucose and ketone readers were really for, um, for diabetics and pre-diabetics. I think they're the greatest tool out there. When I first start with somebody, I always, that when, when I'm coaching somebody, that's the very first thing I get, is I just say, hey, get this meter, and what I want you to do is start taking your morning readings, send them to me, and let's start analyzing them. Because that's, that tool will tell you more about how your food's working for you than anything I've ever seen. It's incredible. And they're like 80 bucks on Amazon. They're not expensive. So and That's the, somebody was asking about checking glucose and that, so that's the, which one do you recommend right now? Right now I recommend Keto Mojo. If you go to drmindypels.com, it's under my favorites. 
Um, so you can go see it there and, and you click on it there, it'll take you right to a link. Here's why I recommend Keto Mojo is that the strips are the cheapest. So I hear a lot from patients like, oh my God, I gotta keep doing my, uh, my ketones and these strips are three bucks a, a strip. Um, well, my first reaction to that is, is three bucks is not a lot to tell you, you know, how, what your food is doing for you, but there are cheaper ways and the Keto Mojo is the cheapest, so. And for diabetics to get down into those numbers, it varies by person, and there's so many factors like stress and things. Yeah. So you want to talk a little bit? Yeah. Through? So uh, you know, just so you know, he wrote a book called the um, the Diabetes Code, and uh, he is really works closely with diabetics. And we've seen in our clinic, in the group of doctors that I work with, we have seen people get. Uh, really reverse diabetes and, and get their numbers way down just by applying techniques like fasting and pulling carbs out and upping good fat. But if you're a diabetic, you definitely want to be coached through that. That's a process that you want to have someone overseeing you with. But if, if again, if I had diabetes today, I would be following this, this to a T and really looking at how I can manipulate my um, blood sugar and my insulin levels uh, so that I can take less insulin. Um, you know, and there's, and we can go and look at Walter Longo's studies on fasting and regeneration of the pancreas from, um, uh, from type one diabetics. So the research is just amazing right now for showing us how beneficial fasting is. But if you're a diabetic, I'd really be coached, so. Okay, as always, I hope that helps. Reach out if you have any questions.